I will promise this is from the DSM. I just didn't put the four up there because there wasn't room. But the DSM four cultural formulation plans, and it, it's in the appendix in the back. Now everybody's supposed to be doing this anytime they do an assessment in mental health. They're supposed to use the cultural formulation, and I think the majority of places are not doing that because culture affects diagnosis. You know, so you can make a, an inaccurate diagnosis, an incorrect diagnosis, if you don't take culture into account. So it's a very, very important thing. And there are a couple of categories that are mentioned, and these, these are three of uh, about four or five, uh, that you look at the cultural identity of the person and their cultural reference group. So who do they identify with, who do they connect? And sometimes that's not always a match because you have people who've been displaced or maybe they've grown up on a reservation that's different from their own because they have a job or their parents had jobs on a different reservation and they basically became socialized into this other tribe, but they're this other tribe over here. So that's important to take into account and how they see themselves. That's what's most important because that will tell you how to work with them. And um, so you want to look at how identified they are with their, their tribal heritage and community and whether they have conflict or stigma around their, their identities. Phenotype is a word that um, in this case is used to represent uh, skin color and features. So you want to pay attention to that. Sometimes there are differences in families and that, becomes, that can become a huge issue. In families, some people are uh, discriminated against in their family because they're too dark or they're too light, or you know, the, it's it's very complicated. So you want to look at that and also in how they see themselves, internal self-representation, and that's important because they may look one way to you, but they identify in a different way, and that's important for you to take into account and and to help them to cope with that, to help them to cope with it how other people respond to them if it doesn't match their own internal uh, identity. I'm thinking of a relative of mine who's, um, who's actually quite fair, and she's lived on the reservation her whole life. But if she were to live off the reservation, she would be seen, and outside of the Dakotas where, you know, like the white people know who the Indians are, <laughs> and kind of, kind of know looks and, you know, and so she's get discriminated against because everybody knows she's native. But if she was to move to some place in California or something, just for example, way away from the reservation, people might think she's white or think that she's Hispanic. <laughs> and I deliberately said Hispanic and not Latino because Latino usually incorporates the more in the indigenous heritage. But and then her whole sense of self could be thrown into kilter because that's not her that's not her experience that's not her life experience that's not her representation so you also want to look at uh, language fluency um, traumatic experiences that are collective experiences and uh, so when you're doing an assessment you would ask about uh, where did you go to school and find out if it was a boarding school and where their parents went to school where their grandparents went and you don't go into talking about it right away because it can be very hard for somebody to talk about, but you sort of make a note of it and you can come back to it. And they'll give you an opening, but what you're doing is you're helping them to become aware and you're giving permission for them to talk about it and making it safe for them to talk about it. And so you want to pay attention to also their kind of uh, emotional relationships or attachments in their culture that that has some effect on grief. And some of these are sort of clinical technical terms, but you want to look at how they, within their culture, they explain their, uh, their illness, you know, or their symptoms or their problems, and um, look at whether they believe, what they believe in, and models like historical trauma soul or uh, concepts of bewitched or bad medicine that some tribes, you know, in, and uh, tribal migration. So, so people coming from other countries to the U.S. are not the only people that experience migration. So that's something to look at. And um, and then there are traditional mourning practices and healing strategies. And then of course all the ongoing uh, communal kinds of 
trauma and conditions of discrimination, oppression, housing. I mean, so you can't look at a 31-year-old man who still lives at home if he's on the reservation. If that particular reservation has a housing shortage and the only people that get homes are, are, children, are families with children, that doesn't mean he's emotionally stunted in his growth and dependent, and you should see some of the things that people come up with, you know, too, when there's a perfectly logical explanation, not to mention that it may be culturally normative for that tribe. So that's, that's an example of that. Um, this I'm not going to go into right now. I just want to mention um, a couple more things here, and then we'll show the video. Um, this is the, these are just two cases where uh, historical trauma issues and culture was really important. One was a 15-year-old girl who had uh, boarding school parents who were recovering from alcohol, and she made a suicide attempt. And in talking with her, she uh, really didn't want to kill herself. She just felt that her parents had suffered so much in their lives that she couldn't burden them with her problems and she didn't know what else to do. So it was like a cry for help because she didn't want to burden her, her parents. So that was kind of that compensatory fantasy thing, trying to take care of the parents. And um, so that was, that's when something like that was very helpful. So to help her to know that this isn't her fault that her parents suffered so much and that they can all talk together as a family, and that's what that's what we did. And the parents were doing very well, actually, in terms of their own sobriety. But they had they had been drinking quite a bit when she was younger. And then another one is a 43-year-old recovering alcoholic with a history of uh, abuse and neglect by boarding school survivor parents who were alcoholics. And his mother his mother died. And uh, then shortly after that, he was uh, feeling depressed, became suicidal, and was unable to cry. And he went to Indian Health Service, and he was put on antidepressants and regular mainstream psychotherapy, but his symptoms wouldn't go away. Well, in exploring further, it ended up that he was given a, a, what we call wiping the tears ceremony prematurely by another uh, close person to him that felt that he was suffering after the death. This was before the suicidal impulses. Well, the ceremony worked. So he that wiped his tears. He wasn't able to cry anymore. But it was premature. So his grief was stunted. I see this with, like, with powwow sometimes when people can't dance for a year after a death and then people have something premature so that the kids can dance. I don't know that that's such a good idea because you're not allowing the normal grief process to go through. And that's what happened with him. So they had another ceremony for him. They told his mother's spirit, and why, what was his suicidal impulses were because his mother's spirit was coming back for him because he was suffering. They told his mother's spirit to leave him alone, that he was fine, his time wasn't done on this earth. And um, after the ceremony, his depression lifted, his suicidal impulses went away, and he started, he was able to cry, he went through a normal grief process, and didn't have to take medication or go to therapy afterwards. So I thought that was a, that's such an amazing example of the power of the cultural formulation done really well and our traditional wisdom and knowledge. And one final thing that I want to, sh uh, to share in terms of research, something that I'm working on now, is a community sample of Amer American Indian Alaska Native adults uh, in a western urban area. And um, we found some interesting differences between direct descendants of historical trauma. So those people that knew that they were like descendants of, just for example, the Uludini Massacre, that they were descendants from that. And uh, those who said no, that they weren't. And then there was this group that said they didn't know. They weren't quite sure. But the, uh, the direct descendants had some interesting things. They, they had a higher degree of what they perceived as mental health issues. They had higher depression. 
they had higher PTSD. Now this is all self-reported, so we didn't use structured measures. And um, they also reported more problems with alcohol and drugs, <coughs> that they thought more about the collective historical trauma. Then the next high school was the don't knows. And that makes sense to me too, because if you think that you might be a trauma survivor, then you know, a direct descendant, then you might be thinking kind of along those same lines. Uh, so that was all significant on one test, and right now we're trying to do some more sophisticated, like a logistic regression on the, these differences. But just to let you know that the percentages were higher, and the, that the one the chi square test showed that there were significant differences among those groups. And then, um, let's see, then the direct descendants also had a greater guilt and feeling responsible for undoing the pain of the past. But at the same time, the direct descendants were more proud of being Native. They had more Native language comprehension. They practiced more traditional cultural uh, practices and spiritual practices, and they felt more connected within the Native community. So, um, so some of the possible explanations that the direct, that we don't know yet, we're trying to figure this out, some we may not know, but uh, the direct descendants may have come from more traditional families, you know, their, their lineage, because in the situation with, I know with the Lakota that, that a lot of us were called the hostiles, I was going to get a t-shirt that had hostile and proud of it, but, uh, you know, that didn't, didn't go along with right away settling on the reservation and trying to, to resist what was, what was happening, to resist the, the genocide. So those groups of families may have hung on more to the traditional culture. Maybe they were more full blood. You know, there's all kinds of possible explanations why the language would persist more. Um, but they may, but also may have had more trauma exposure. So that's something they may be older. We're trying to check on the age differences too. And look, we're going to look more at what's what's the deal with the uh, the people who don't know. So it just sort of suggests that there could be some tribal differences in historic trauma that still needs to be researched. And again, uh, I mentioned uh, you know, the, the work here of colleagues, uh, also uh, Karina Walters, and uh, who's been doing a lot of work on trying to, uh, to assess historical trauma, historical trauma, uh, colonial trauma response, uh, things like that. that that I know you'll have the opportunity to talk more with her about that. But this is all important work that we need to, we need to keep doing. And this is the last one. Uh, so I just recommend that in general. We need lots of help with trying to figure all these out. How, how do you measure it? You know, because my work focused on the intervention as sort of the theory of it and not so much on how do you measure it. That's an important thing that we need so this video that I'm going to show um, really sums everything up, and we call it a celebration of survival. And, and again, using the word Takini, which means survivor, or to come back to life, and describes the uh, Models for Healing Indigenous Survivors of Historical Trauma Conferences that we had, the first one being in 2001, just before 9-11. And it goes through that, kind of summarizes everything. And then when we get to the credits, um, if we can turn down the volume at the end, I'll, I'll let you know when that is. To help us heal, you know, in our hearts and, and have that connection is it's possible. So thank you so much. And I'm going to turn it over to Polly.
Uh, I, I just came literally from the woods and the mountains of uh, the Rockies, so uh, this, this, I don't know how much stress like this.